good morning, dear colleagues, dear friends. Good afternoon. Uh, um, distinguished speaker, panelists, uh, participants, it's really an honor and, and, and a pleasure to welcome you to this <clears throat> regional webinar on the COVID-19 response and digitalization in Europe and Central Asia. Um, I'm, I'm just coming, in fact, also from the EU FAO strategic dialogue. Actually, this is still running. Um, and where digitalization, of course, is also a key issue um, of the discussion. So the um, webinar uh, today is, is really very timely because technology and innovation are of paramount importance in FAO's work, and it's increasing uh, going to be really important. It's a key element of um, the strategic framework, of the new strategic framework 2022 uh, to two, uh, 2031, so really for the next uh, 10 years. It's widely recognized that digitalization can and is a key accelerator supporting the transformation of uh, the food systems. And the food systems itself is a key accelerator in order to achieve also the SDGs. Digitalization supports uh, achieving economic, environmental, and social sustainability in the agro-food system. And therefore, it's really um, a key element uh, also supporting our aspirations, leaving no one uh, behind. So technology, innovation, and digitalization are embedded in the regional work program with our focus on smallholders and youth, food systems transformation, and sustainable uh, natural resource management. Emerging technologies are already changing uh, the food and agriculture sector, yet most of the governments or the agri-food systems actors have yet really to harness their powerful potential. So helping farmers take full advantage of new approaches, such as digital agriculture, precision agriculture, biotechnologies and innovation in agroecology to increase food production whilst respecting the environment will need to be emphasis in national policies. To give an example, agri-food sector um, can harness digital tools ranging from e-commerce, mobile technologies for increasing access to markets to the use of also artificial intelligence for improved pest controls and crop uh, genetics, as well as tools allowing an optimized management of natural resources and early warning of food security threats. FAO has launched several global and regional initiatives supporting the digital rural transformation, such as the Geo Special Platform and the Digital Village Initiative. The Digital Village Initiative will be definitely a key issue in order to also further transfer knowledge and um, science in this context between the countries and from countries where already some of this technology is already uh, available. However, we are not alone in this process. The digitalization activities are driven by a variety of stakeholders um, using diverse technologies. And we are glad to see the representatives of various of these sectors and organizations amongst the speakers and panelists also today. This excellent composition of um, the speakers. And let me thank um, already all the speakers and panelists for your readiness and availability to this imp important discussion. And agri-food sector in their respective fields during the challenging pandemic period. So many digital initiatives were completed already in our region. Many were initiated and we are expecting more to be uh, triggered. So dear participants, the objective of the webinar uh, today is really to present a number of technologies out of the wide digital agriculture range, such as E-Trade mechanisms, 
internet connectivity in remote areas, precision farming systems, crop predictions, and weather monitoring. The presentations of our speakers will really focus on the interconnectivity and the potential benefits of these technologies, as well as challenges to practical implementation during the pandemic. I really hope and I'm convinced that the discussions will be a contribution to identifying the regional digital trends in agriculture during the pandemic, sharing the experience of various stakeholders, building resilience when faced with a crisis, and shaping digital strategies in agriculture in post-pandemic. I also invite you to use the webinar really as a basis for further exchange and collaboration in this important area of digital agriculture. And I would very much welcome further collaboration in this area. In concluding, a quick remark about the series of these webinars. With this session, we are closing the series of 12 webinars that we have started just a year ago um, with the aim of facilitating multi-stakeholder dialogues on the impacts of COVID on the food systems. I think the series provided really an excellent opportunity to exchange experience amongst others on extension services, smallholders, research and innovation and migration, as well as many others. You can uh, have the recording available on the website of the regional office, but they have been also all been made available on YouTube. So with this, I'm really looking forward to the discussion today and um, a fruitful exchange. And of course, this as a starting point for a continued uh, dialogue. Unfortunately, I cannot stay with you for the whole session. So I wish you really um, good luck and uh, an interesting uh, deliberation. Thank you. Back to you, Victor. Thank you, Raymond. An excellent overview of uh, our meeting today and uh, what was done and will be done by FAO in the region. Uh, of course, digitalization is a key. And of course, FAO, uh, our office is doing a lot on this in the region. But indeed, uh, it's we're not alone. And other units and other stakeholders are quite important. And it's well represented. And we are looking forward indeed to what will be said. Uh, but to start it, to, to start the discussion, I think it would be quite great and quite important to mm -hmm. see what was done by uh, FAO in the region. And for that, I am giving the floor to uh, Sophie Trenin, uh, mm -hmm. regional, uh, regional digital agriculture team leader. Sophie, floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Victor, for uh, um, passing the floor and for setting the stage. So um, we have been working on uh, digital agriculture, of course, uh, way before uh, COVID. And let's go immediately into the next slide uh, to really show that uh, information and communication technologies, digital technologies are nowadays everywhere. Uh, whether it's on our phone, computer, uh, whether we are using broadcasting, web platform, cloud, remote sensing, artificial intelligence, sensors, digital communication, robotics, software solution, internet of things, blockchain. So you see a great diversity now of technologies. And in the next slide, you will see that in agriculture, there are a lot of opportunities offered by these digital technologies. We are using them in agriculture extension and advisory services. They are helping us for a more sustainable farming, but they are also very important for disaster risk management and early warning system. With market being disrupted uh, during COVID time, digitalization was really something important and it can really enhance the market access. And we want to have to be sure that our food is safe. So the traceability is also a sector where uh, we can work uh, with digitalization. But not only that, also financial services and insurance and to be a, we are using also digitalization for capacity development and uh, to empower 
uh, people, communities, women, youth, and also elders. So we also have the digital skills to improve the usability of uh, digital technologies. But this cannot happen if you don't have a regulatory framework. And this is why we are also working on strategies and making sure that this is embedded uh, into uh, national programs, agenda, and that everybody is involved. So let's move now to how is the digital divide? It is unfortunately still a reality. Uh, it is a reality and it is more so even in rural areas. During the COVID time, um, there was an increased demand of connectivity for e-commerce, e-health, teleworking. Um, but in rural areas, uh, and some of us connected today are really facing this, the connection is unstable, irregular, of poor quality, and we pay the same price as in the cities. So uh, there are still room for improvement. And we realize that there is a lower use of digital technologies in uh, agriculture in rural areas. And um, this is specifically true for small older farmers. And this is maybe due to poor services and um, lack of investments, investments from farmer side, but also investments from public sector sides. So let's see how is uh, our region and these challenges. So the human challenges uh, um, in our region are can be embedded in these different factors. The young generation is living rural areas and um, we need to attract uh, and keep the rural areas and agriculture as attractive for the young generation. Because our farming population is really aging. Uh, the average age of a farmer is above uh, 50 years old. And the majority of farmers are small holders. Um, with the COVID, we have seen that due to the seasonal migration, there was shortage of farm labor. Uh, so this is something that was already an issue, but that has been exacerbated during the COVID pandemic. Um, we also face another uh, problem is the negative connotation of the word cooperative. So we need to really enhance collaboration, cooperation among the smallholder farmers. And some farmers, um, not the young one, but the older generation has a conservative attitude uh, towards technology. Uh, and um, women and elders and poor have left access and control over technologies. Uh, and because a lot of issues are related to their digital skills. So let's move now to what are the challenges in the next slide of a small older farmers. So in the region, the, the farm size varied a lot uh, because we have very small uh, farms to extremely big and still they are called small older farmers. So it's really depending from one country to another in the region. And um, what are the issues is that the technologies are sometimes available, but not always adequate for small farmers reality because you need to have a larger farm to be able to do that. So um, some, what we have to make sure is that small orders are not excluded from policy in, in incentive and rural services. Um, and um, we also have to face another uh, challenge is the capacity uh, to generate, use and manage data and information at all levels, whether it's farmers, service producers or regulators. And so access to and control of data in the agri-food sector is uh, also still something that we need uh, to work on due to the limited integration in market change, the limited decision-making powers and unclear on, um, unclear on farm data ownership. 
whether it's a farmer or is it the private sector or the government. So we need to also regulate this and have a clarity. Let's move to the next the slide, please. So all these issues and challenges uh, can be summarized with keywords. Uh, and we are using some of these. So be sure that technologies are accessible, affordable, appropriate, adaptable, and actionable. And this is related to uh, replying to bar the barriers I've mentioned to you about the connectivity, the cost, the content, to have good content, localized context, which is um, uh, really replying to the request and the needs in, of the people or uh, in local and rural areas. Their capacity at different levels, whether it's institutional or whether it's an individual. And we need to also have trust in what is being done and confidence in using these technologies. And this is why we should reply with a people-centered approach using participation and partnership from the different sectors, participation from the different actors in the society and the, in the partnership between public, private, civil society, academia. So this is a long process and it should be based on learning lessons from the practices, whether they are failures or successes. So hopefully we should keep this digital transformation still simple, sustainable, and as an approach, a system approach. And um, the publication there, it's really to show you that all these aspects have been covered in the publication on gender and ICTs. So how is FAO um, responding to this? So we have helped um, having um, guidelines to actually develop a national frameworks. Uh, we are looking at uh, the gender issues and taking really the people-centered approach. On a regular basis, we are doing a regional assessment. We are also doing national assessment and the latest publication with ITU is on the status of digital agriculture in 18 countries of Europe and Central Asia. And the Russian version of this publication will be able uh, available this year. But all the work that we are doing, as mentioned by uh, Raymond Dielle, is embedded in the work and the program of work of uh, in the region and uh, with the member states. And so we are also sharing you these uh, documents. And then, uh, of course, things are moving. And I have also added from France to space, uh, from space to farm, sorry. Um, and we will be able to talk about this in uh, the panel discussion. So in a conclusion, in the next slide, uh, you will see that a conducive environment for digital agriculture requires this inclusive approach that I mentioned, people approach, not leaving any one behind, that we have to improve the infrastructure, both for ICTs and also in the agriculture sector. We still have to increase awareness on what are the benefits, the challenges that have to be overcome. Um, and it's important that we continue sharing knowledge, sharing good practices. And uh, we will not bridge the rural digital divide if we are not improving digital skills. Uh, so this is something that we are also working on. And this should be embedded in a regulatory framework conducive to innovation and that takes into account the specificities and the risk that digitalization entails. So okay, great, great, Sophie. thank you so much. Uh, again, it's a very good overview of what was already done and uh, what is to be done and how digital agriculture depends on many sectors and many prerequisites, I would say, and it's great uh, that you outlined all those elements. Uh, out of all those variety of uh, prerequisites, uh, maybe connectivity to rural areas will be one of the main ones and one of the major obstacles. And uh, on that note, I'd like to give the floor to Yaroslav Ponder, who is coming from Inter International uh, Telecommunication Unit. Uh, Yaroslav is uh, head of European Office of the Union and who's better than him can represent the digitalization and connectivity trends in the region. Thank uh, you very much. Please, Yaroslav, the floor is yours. 
Yes, thank you very much, uh, Victor, and thank you very much, uh, Sophie, for uh, uh, inviting ITU to this very important uh, dialogue on the digitalization of the uh, agriculture, which is very close to our uh, heart. Uh, we, as the ITU, being the UN specialized agency in charge of the ICTs, uh, we are paying very much attention uh, to the uh, connectivity, uh, but also to the meaningful connectivity. It's not only about providing the cable and uh, to the home and to the uh, to the unit, but also to build upon this what creates real value proposition. And I think that this value proposition in case of the agriculture can be uh, really much more strengthened, but uh, certain parameters have to be um, also addressed. And many of those um, already Selfie has uh, addressed. So recently in the preparations uh, towards uh, the World Telecommunication Development Conference, which is our milestone uh, conference uh, discussing all digital transformation undertakings by the government uh, and taking a look uh, how to accelerate the transformation, transformative power of the ICTs uh, for the SDGs. Um, we have prepared and took a look at uh, where we stand with the connectivity. And today I have the pleasure, uh, not speaking only on behalf of the uh, European region, but also uh, our colleagues from the CIS um, uh, region um, and to the office um, uh, which is a place in Moscow. Uh, so we encourage you to download uh, those, uh, those two publications uh, as uh, they're going a little bit in depth uh, and giving good understanding uh, the challenge of the connectivity in the context of the digital transformation. Next step. Uh, next slide. So, of course, uh, all of us, we have the feeling that the world is becoming mobile, and this is true, and uh, it's true for uh, all Europe and Central Asia, as we see on those graphs, uh, the equally European and Central Asia countries uh, are uh, well connected in terms of the providing the access to the, um, and to the ICTs through the mobile uh, connectivity. Um, usually uh, going up to the 4G, but now you are entering in the new phase of implementation of the 5G, and many countries are just embarking uh, on this uh, important journey, which requires additional investment, but the technology which will offer us uh, not only to make uh, the real gigabit society uh, reality, but more importantly, providing also the proper foundation for digitalization of the sector and providing uh, the sector the possibility that Internet of Things, uh, smart agriculture um, so, and uh, smart production um, becomes reality that uh, artificial intelligence about which we are reading so much in the context of the um, of uh, the agricultural sector uh, can really debug and to grow uh, in terms of the applications of different uh, services. So next slide, please. So this is the reason why we are also taking a look at the uh, use of the mobile telecommunication in terms of the mobile broadband. And we see that when we are diving in those numbers already, and uh, the use and the number of the subscribers is very different and diverse and very different from this, what we've seen uh, from uh, this just simple subscription to the mobile technology. So let's keep in mind the connectivity is good, but the quality of the connectivity uh, and the access to the broadband uh, through the mobile technology has an important uh, meaning. And when we, many of you going through the countryside, um, very often experience the lack of the connection, lack of uh, and the connection and the service, basic service, voice service. So uh, in order to change this, we need to uh, also make uh, the systemic change, which we will be talking about just in a second. Next slide. So also let's take a look at the, um, uh, the broadband, uh, fixed broadband connectivity, uh, which is taking off, but not that as fast as possible uh, uh, it could be, uh, and requires much more um, at attention. The uh, urban versus rural connectivity is still becomes a significant challenge. Once the uh, urban um, 
uh, agglomerations are very well connected in the rural uh, areas. We still do not have the proper um, rollout of the broadband. Uh, and in different countries, uh, it rolls with different dynamics. Uh, and it's, it's not only the advocacy and the challenge of the ministers of ICTs and the regulators, but also of the, the, uh, of the ministers of agriculture and those who are creating the significant demand because without this infrastructure we cannot progress with the um, next layer value added um, proposed by the services next slide also when we are taking a look at the pricing we see and uh, that in terms of the pricing even though most of the countries in europe and central asia are below uh, the target of the UN Broadband Commission uh, sets uh, by the United Nations Broadband Commission commissioners uh, uh, to be below 2% of the uh, GNI. Um, but still, we have some countries where this connectivity is a challenge. It's a challenge for the end users uh, who should benefit uh, from uh, the daily connectivity, but also for those who are using this in more entrepreneurial um, uh, meaning. Next slide. Also, when we are taking a look at uh, the issue of uh, the um, digital skills, what uh, Sophie already mentioned, uh, we see that the dynamics in Europe and uh, Central Asia is very different and uh, very significant uh, efforts needs to be dedicated because we can face the situation that uh, even though we'll create a lot of service, uh, services and value proposition coming from the ICT industry, unfortunately, the end user will not be able to use it properly. And this is the challenge which we need to address from the more systemic point of view to make sure uh, that all this innovation is embedded and adopted from the inception point of view and not uh, just later on and uh, just to become uh, the follower. Next slide. Of course, uh, we have the challenge of the gender. Uh, once we are, these are the data for the global uh, reach and global average. We will see uh, that we have around 5% to, to, to 7%, depending on the country uh, of the difference. Once we are taking a look at the disaggregated data uh, at the rural um, areas, these data are looking even worse. And this makes us really worried. Uh, and this is some space where we really hope to uh, advance in the near future uh, much stronger. Next slide, please. So what has to happen also to make this change? Uh, and um, in order to unlock investment in the non-profitable uh, areas and to bridge the digital uh, rur rural divide, uh, we need to make sure that enabling environment provides the conditions for the investment. And that's why we are monitoring uh, the enabling environment in all countries. And as you see, the dynamics looks very different uh, because of the some assumptions of the, and the strategies of the countries, but also uh, because of of the speed of adoption of certain good practices from the different coming from the different countries. So th there is still uh, the work to be done in order to reach uh, this golden um, reference point, uh, the uh, generation uh, fifth uh, of the regulation and by all countries, uh, what is happening already, already progressively, but very slow. So next slide. Um, when we, when we, uh, so there are several items uh, to be addressed in order to um, uh, to make the progress. Uh, but once we are coming to the diversity uh, of the items and the moves uh, to be done in order to accelerate digital agriculture um, uh, uh, expansion, uh, we need also uh, to take a look at the cross sectoral. Um, um, collaboration. And this is something what is very close to our, um, and our heart. And this is something what has been advocated. Next slide. When we are talking with the membership, uh, when we are designing the regional initiatives for Europe. And thank you very much, uh, uh, FAO, and also other UN agencies and the community uh, of uh, FAO uh, for advocating this when we are discussing about this with the ICT ministries. So 
just to close, um, so I encourage you to take a look at the different regional initiatives and the synergies between this, what we are doing as the ICT community, and this, what we are creating uh, together with uh, the FAO, uh, bringing into the discussion these two communities. So just to close, uh, there are several um, uh, goods um, deliverables of the joint work with FAO, and um, uh, we are very proud of this collaboration. And we just draw attention to the recent developments uh, on uh, the focusing on the activation of the ICT centric ecosystem targeting specifically agriculture. And we hope uh, that uh, you will be able to, to see very soon uh, the excellent uh, compendium of the over uh, almost 200 uh, digital solutions which are making change in the way how the digital agriculture functions, providing the solutions uh, to those uh, who are uh, in the business and looking how to increase the efficiency um, through the digital. So we look forward to the great collaboration and also to the great discussions during this, uh, this session. And thank you very much for, um, for your attention. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you so much, Yaroslav. Excellent overview of what was happening and we're always happy to collaborate and open for that. Of course, uh, Digital agriculture is a huge area and there is a lot of different technologies. Sometimes you can do things without connectivity, but it's very relevant and very important specifically for smallholders in uh, remote areas in challenging locations, as I would call it. So on this note, I'd like to give a floor to Hank Tran, who is uh, working on, uh, on this topic, trying to bring connectivity and Internet to the uh, areas uh, without it coming from company CIS. Uh, Hank, floor is yours, please. Okay, okay. <clears throat> Victor, thank you so much. It's an honor and privilege uh, to be here with you um, all today. That was really great uh, presentation from uh, Sophie and Jaroslav. I've learned a lot already, uh, you know, from looking at uh, some of the items that you guys are working on. Uh, that's, that's amazing. Um, so, as Victor mentioned, um, I'm from the uh, private industry. Uh, I work for SES, and I'll go through some of the things that we, we do. Um, next slide, please. Um, as we all know, uh, prior to the uh, pandemic, a paradigm shift toward digitalization, uh, the technology was well underway. Uh, just that COVID-19 had really, really uh, speeded up the adoption of technologies. Uh, I think I've seen it uh, somewhere in statistic that uh, within, in, instead of doing this uh, over five years uh, with COVID-19, it really uh, pushed it up in a few months. Um, as you can imagine, <clears throat> last year when COVID happened, um, all of a sudden, you know, we were asked to do the remote work. Uh, the kids were asked to stay home to do this and learning. Um, as Sophie mentioned earlier, um, it's, it's fine for the first world uh, countries. However, in a lot of the rural places, uh, such as in Africa or even here in the US in, in the rural area, um, it was not that easy for some of those people uh, to do these basic things that we take for granted, uh, such as connectivity, right? Uh, so everything has changed for all of us, such as telemedicines, uh, just being able to do the basic things and we couldn't do it. So for example, um, I, I do support a lot of the UN, UN agencies uh, and definitely in Central African Republic in Bangui, uh, when, when it first happened, um, the UN staff was not able to do a lot of these things because the infrastructure was not available. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, we, we take some of these things for granted such as digitalization. Sure, it sounds great, uh, but some of these rural areas, um, it's not that easy to do these things. Um, so in, in this digital area, high speed connectivity and reliable network access is the utmost important to empower business and communities, especially uh, remote area as uh, Sophie mentioned earlier. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Um, so this map here, I just wanna show you uh, uh, just to see that um, the connectivity that we have today, right? Uh, this is this shows all the uh, submarine cables, uh, and if you look at it uh, along the major cities, um, they are well connected. Uh, but if you go in in the middle of, of the continents, uh, the landlocked countries, 
uh, the submarine cable, um, the connectivity doesn't quite reach some of these locations. And as you can see, with the lack of connectivity, it, the, the, the rural area really suffer. Um, you know, for example, we were working uh, on a project with the uh, Uni, Unido uh, for the smart villages, just the basic things of uh, being able to access the information in some of these uh, villages in Nigeria was really difficult. You know, people have to travel uh, to places or downloading the information on a thumb drive and access it. So it's not really real time information. Uh, you know, just to show the uh, the challenges uh, in some of these uh, locations uh, that they have to endure, uh, and that's why we as SES uh, trying to work with some of these uh, governments, uh, UN agencies, uh, to help to mitigate some of these uh, these problems. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I would be amiss if I didn't take a few minutes to talk about um, who we are and what we do. Um, SES is the largest uh, satellite operator uh, in the world today. Uh, the headquarters is based in Luxembourg. We, as I mentioned, we do a lot of work uh, supporting uh, governments, uh, the UN, UN agencies. So, for example, um, if if you on a, if you're on a boat or, or a plane and need to be connected, a lot of that service uh, come from SES. Um, as, as I mentioned, we, we do support and work with the emergency telecom uh, uh, clusters uh, supporting disasters. So if there's a, a hurricane or a flood uh, that take place, uh, we work quite well with the ETTC, which is really typically sponsored by the World Food Program. Uh, to, to go through and support a lot of these uh, disaster responses. Um, next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned, um, SES is the largest uh, satellite operator today. Um, in a lot of these locations, uh, whether it's on the fringes uh, of, of the Central Asia or, or in the landlocked country, you know, jungle of, of, of DRC, uh, the best things uh, to, to reach of some of these locations is through satellite, uh, because the, the fiber, um, it's either difficult or it's really cost prohibitive uh, for a lot of these telco companies uh, to be able to extend range uh, out to some of the location. Uh, this slide, just to show you um, the innovation um, that we are working on, um, we've been using this technology to support um, a lot of the uh, markets in Central Asia, uh, Africa, and it really helps uh, a lot of the market that we hear. So for example, simple things as uh, someone being able to pick up the phone and ask for the, the weather or, or the price of a certain crop, that really gives them uh, real-time information uh, that they didn't have before. Right. Um, at the end of the day, we want to provide the real time information uh, to to the villagers uh, so that they can you know, make a smart decision based on this uh, information that, as I mentioned earlier, we take it for granted uh, on a lot of place places with with this satellite. Um, it's really um, flexible. It provides a lot of great services uh, to to a lot of these. Uh, you know, villages. A lot of time, most people think of satellite as slow and unreliable services. However, uh, you know, as you mentioned earlier, with the uh, changing in technology, the advancement in the satellite technology have led to an improved user experience. You know, gone are the days of endless buffering due to the high latency and low speed internet. Right? Uh, we we have proved uh, for the past few years that passengers on, on cruise ships or on, on the planes are able to, to serve uh, the, the information just as today. Now, so the next time you know you want to take a nap on a plane and you must check the, uh, the, the service, you can thank us for that. Um, on this one, I just want to show that we when we come in and do a project with uh, a lot of these locations, we want to work with local uh, telco partners um, why is that? From our experience working with the governments and the UN agencies, um, it's good that we, the local companies, they, they know and understand the local, the regulations 
And at the end of the day, it's good for the economy uh, that we work with a lot of these telco companies. Um, if I may interrupt, I just you want... have one minute left. Okay. Um, next slide, please. Um, I just on this one, just want to show the a couple of the projects that we work with uh, other um, agencies. Uh, so, for example, uh, this past April, uh, we signed an MOU with the Kazakhstan uh, government, uh, supporting their digitalization process. Um, if you can move on to the next one, uh, just to show that you know there's a map where a lot of the small villages. Uh, that it's difficult for them to access uh, the information uh, that we mentioned before, right? The ability to access the information, uh, the payment system. So with this uh, connectivity, um, it really brings uh, the people and the villages uh, together. And really at the end of the day, right? It's access for everyone. Um, last but not least, um, go back to the first slide, right? Uh, so even once the COVID uh, is finished, um, Go ahead, the next one, please. Yeah, even when when post COVID, um, there will be no return to normal. I mean, the remote work arrangement, the hybrid uh, distance learning, uh, telemedicine, I think it will be here. And connectivity is part of the infrastructure. Uh, so with that, Victor, uh, again, thank you so much for having me and uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Hank, and apologies for interrupting and uh, just making your smooth uh, talk a bit interrupted yet. Uh, and apologies in advance for all other speakers who will have to interrupt if you're going above eight minutes as we agreed. Uh, I have my noble duty in front of all the attendees that we will try to stick to two hours as we schedule. So uh, on that note, I mean, it's, it's great, a great indeed uh, what you were referencing and, and mentioning. And of course, uh, partnership and collaboration is, is a key between public and, and private uh, stakeholders in bringing connectivity to, to all those challenging uh, areas in challenging times, as you said, it's very COVID indeed is a very challenging time for everyone. But, and as Yaroslav mentioned, it's, it's a very important to make this connectivity meaningful and that's our next session will be devoted on that and uh, before going there i can see some questions uh, in our q and a uh, session in q and a functionality and i am inviting again anyone to publish your questions there were relevant to that meaningful collectivity and all the uh, aspects of different applications let's say let me pick one here uh that was about about any subsidies for smallholders if it's possible to get uh, subsidies for smallholders to invest in technological infrastructure if you can briefly somehow reference to it because we do know connectivity costs a lot and it's a lot of uh, um, a lot of a lot of funds required for this you Hank said it's not expensive but if you can reflect a little bit more on this and Yaroslav uh, within short answer that would be great again I will repeat the question is there any international subsidies uh, is there any internationals the question jumped is there any international subsidies program for smallholders farmers to invest in technological infrastructure thanks so, so thank you for that, uh, Victor. Um, we, we do a lot of the uh, projects, whether with uh, uh, you know countries in Africa or Central Asia, and if necessary, um, SES, um, we do make donations to some of these uh, projects uh, when it's necessary, right? Uh, and then we do a lot of this stuff, for, for, for example, last year when uh, COVID-19 hit, uh, we already support the UN agencies and we made a lot of donations to, to some of these uh, agencies uh, during this difficult time. So, so yes, um, you know, as part of the uh, corporate social responsibility, uh, when we work on some of these projects, uh, we do make donations uh, toward it. Um, and I, you know, we can certainly take it offline, you know, on a specific projects as well. Okay, great, great to know. And it's uh, anyone who was attending can see all their credentials. And if there's any discussion or interest from participants, they can reach you out. Indeed. Thank you so much, Hank, for that. 
Uh, I'm uh, turning to Yaroslav. Do you have anything to add on that specific question? Indeed. Uh, another question was coming: If there is any, if there is any opportunities for service providers to collaborate and engage in the programs in UNFAO, uh, may I uh, direct this question to uh, maybe Sophie, who probably would be representing UNFAO on that quickly, if you can mention something. I think that uh, this is the right moment to make the transition with the next speaker who is exactly going to answer this question. So uh, rather than replying myself, I would prefer to have George Bears explaining what is being done. Absolutely, it's a brilliant idea. Uh, let's uh, do that. Uh, George, uh, floor is coming to you. And as we know, we're starting with a little bit of video coming from you. And then for your thanks. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the vulnerabilities in the European agri-food industry. It has disrupted our food supply chain and affected the lives of people working in the sector. Guaranteed access to fresh food is more important than ever. It is not only hotels, bars and restaurants that are struggling. Travel restrictions are also causing severe labour shortages in the agri-food sector. The COVID-19 pandemic and the ongoing climate emergency require a more sustainable agri-food system. The twin challenge of resilience and sustainability in agriculture can be achieved through digital innovation. This is how the smart agri-hubs community responded. The creation of online marketplaces allows the most vulnerable members of society to satisfy their basic needs in an efficient way, as our digital innovation hub, Pays de la Loire, has shown. The use of robotics, precision agriculture and online matchmaking services can address critical labour shortages. Our flagship innovation experiment, Autonomous Greenhouses, tackles this. Most of the solutions will encompass a digital application, whether it is through data-driven platforms, AI-based tools or matchmaking algorithms, the potential is enormous. Smart AgriHub's digital innovation hubs across Europe assist in the development of these solutions and foresee what is needed to bring these promising ideas to the market. Thousands of organisations and individuals have joined up within the scope of this project. The innovation portal helps to deliver a digitalised European agri-food sector that remains efficient yet is still resilient and sustainable. The community is expanding enormously. Join us and be part of this sustainable wave. Okay, I'll share my screen. Yes, George, we can confirm we can see everything. Please go ahead. Okay. Well, thanks, uh, Victor, for uh, giving uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, to uh, present how the Smart Agri Hubs community, uh, a pan-European network dedicated to uh, digital transformation in uh, in agriculture, how we responded to the COVID nineteen uh, crisis. Uh, maybe first some words on the on the project. <clears throat> I think it's. Uh, uh, good to be aware that the digital transformation takes place at local level in the fields uh, close to farmers and farmers are ground bound so they are they cannot move their location they are so the digitization has to take place at the local level uh, but on the other hand we see a lot of uh, examples in, in european projects national projects where digitization is uh, is, is taking place and the project is about how to connect the dots how to make the state of the art as it is present in uh, all over Europe, how to make it available for farmers in the region that want to digitize. Um, this is not only for farmers to, to digitize, it's also for um, not doing the same everywhere, but building upon each other's experiences and, and, and results instead of doing the same all over, uh, all over uh, again. Um, the, the, the concept we are using for that is Digital Innovation Hub, and the Digital Innovation Hub is a local uh, center, center of expertise, you can say. It's close to farmers, 
So it's in a region where farmers uh, farming is an important activity, and it's uh, the Digital Innovation Hub is supporting farmers and is promoting digital tools, digital solutions to their own farmers, to the farmers community at local level. Uh, they do it by uh, providing services, not only on technology, but also in, uh, in business and on, uh, on, on ecosystems, so brokerage events and so on. And for the business part, it's also important that digital innovation hubs have a service for uh, looking for funding, looking for the funding opportunities. Um, we have about, uh, we are targeting on 400 of these digital innovation hubs and how to connect the dots. And it's already illustrated in the, in the animation that we have a, an uh, innovation portal for that. In the innovation portal, we are collecting um, good practices on digitization. So interesting projects that can be uh, interesting for, uh, for other people. We are making a register of competence centers. So this is not a, uh, a, a, a register, yellow pages or something like that. It's a, it's, it's a uh, register where we have uh, companies that can provide innovation services. And we have a collection of digital innovation hubs. Uh, so digital innovation hub can contact each other and interact with each other. And a lot of uh, tools and uh, guidelines, webinars for developing the services of the digital innovation hubs. So all in all, this is a lot of knowledge that we collect in the innovation portal and make it available for digital innovation hubs at local level to provide service to their community. So that's about the, uh, like I said, we are targeting on 400 digital innovation hubs. At, uh, at the moment, as we speak, we are halfway the project. It's a four year project. We already have 250 uh, digital innovation hub connected to our network. Uh, how did we respond to, to, to COVID? Because we are an H2020 project and we got a request from the European Commission. What can you do to, uh, to, to, to help us out in this, uh, this, uh, this COVID crisis? Um, for that, we uh, established a task force on COVID-19 and the task force uh, developed a, a vision on what agriculture, what digital agriculture can do to, uh, to, to reduce the negative impacts of the COVID crisis. Um, I think it's uh, the, 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 the special edition that we made on this in the newsletter. I can recommend everybody to take a look at that uh, and to see what, we, uh, what our vision is and how we are communicating it to the, to the, to the farming community and to the smart agri-hub community. And I think uh, the, the animation is one of the, let's say, uh, results of that. Um, I, I don't have the time to go into all the details, but I want to focus on the open calls that we also launched uh, dedicated to, uh, to uh, the COVID uh, crisis. Um, the call was uh, focusing on, on the challenges, uh, the challenges of the broken supply chains due to the COVID and on the issue of labor, labor shortage in, this, in the agricultural sector. As a result, we got... Um, <clears throat> Eight SME solutions that we uh, granted, that we uh, funded, and uh, uh, to give you an idea on this uh, SME solutions, so it's uh, SME companies that are providing solutions. An interesting one was to reduce the visits of veterinarians to dairy farms, so a tool to 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 support online the farmers online on the the healthcare of their cows. We have an interesting uh, example of a uh, let's say in the labor reduction. A, um, uh, an application to, uh, to, 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 uh, to manage the flocks in, in the poultry. Um, we have a, um, an, uh, an, an, uh, an example of uh, uh, robots in the packing, packing of fruits, so also to, to reduce the labor. Uh, a uh, platform, or maybe you can say a marketplace for seasonal workforces, that's also one of the solutions that uh, as an SME is working on. And of course, we have a couple of uh, marketplaces for local produce to, re to, to shorten the supply chain. They have, um, we have business to business uh, platforms, but also business to consum consumers uh, platforms. So these are a few examples in the SME solutions. On the other hand, we also have 13 hackathons. And to explain for those who are not familiar with uh, hackathons, Hackathon is a competition. You bring together a lot of expertise of people interested in, in the challenges. You bring them together, make them forming teams. 
and think about bright ideas to uh, to to deal with the, these challenges. And uh, the, the the function of these hackathons is to to mobilize people, to bring people together from different from IT, from agri, and maybe some other uh, knowledge That's domains. You bring them together. And you uh, uh, challenge them to, to bring out the best ideas. So it's a really a competition, and uh, there are prizes for the best ideas. Uh, the 13 hackathons are presented in a, a nice uh, overview in this, 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 uh, in this link. So you please take a look at that to have more. Uh, uh, then you can see what's, 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 what the ideas are. So in summary, I think uh, the Smart Agri Hubs community responded quite uh, uh, efficient and effective to this uh, this COVID uh, crisis, and um, I think it's uh, for the audience today. It is important that we are in an open innovation, so everybody is uh, welcome to join us. If you are want to establish a digital innovation hub, please uh, register yourself on our web portal. It's not we are an EU project, but we are open to other. Uh, areas in the world and uh, please uh, connect us make use of all the knowledge that we have in our innovation portal and please also provide us your knowledge in the innovation portal okay thank you very much uh, Victor. Thank, thank you thank you george that was george beers coordinator of smart agri hubs european union project with the good examples how to make the connectivity meaningful and variety of them uh, great george uh good over you but now let's move to some specific examples and on that note i'd like to introduce marcus picard economic affairs officer at uh, you can united nations economic commission for europe who will be talking more about e-trade and potential solutions there please marcus floor is yours um, yes so thank you for inviting you and ece to this uh, very important meeting and also very timely meeting uh, given the situation that uh, the global pandemic uh, has created. If you could uh, please uh, put my presentation on screen. Uh, so as we have uh, very little time, thank you, it's a good slide. Um, so um, next slide, please. Uh, UNECE is in the UN system, the focal point, the global focal point to, to develop standards, best practice and recommendations for international trade. We do this in a specific unit, uh, the UN Center for Trade Facilitation and Electronic Business, UNCFAC. Uh, this is about uh, 1,000 uh, participants uh, working uh, as volunteers in this center. Uh, we develop global standards, in particular on the standard side, standards for electronic business. And these standards support the complete uh, supply chain. So that is from production, distribution, regulatory control, uh, down to finance and, and insurance. Now, trade is something that is intrinsically linked to everything else uh, that uh, affects humans. And so if you develop uh, standards for international trade, and you have to work with uh, all other players. Uh, so it, I made a list here of some of the standards uh, and players uh, that, that we're working with, in particular uh, FAO, IEC, IPPC, and so on and so forth. Now, what we do is we develop um, uh, uh, standards for electronic information exchange. So, for example, sanitary phytosanitary certificates, electronic site certificates, quality certificates, just to, to mention this. Uh, and, and that's what we're doing. It's, but the, the standard itself is at, uh, is, and Mr. Yil in the opening said, uh, uh, e-business technologies are, are accelerators for change. And so if you have a standard, this is the basis and the precondition for a lot of other things uh, that you want to introduce in an agriculture supply chain, that is improvement of the uh, uh, logistics and, and trade uh, uh, supply chain, improvement of trade procedures, uh, traceability, transparency, using of modern uh, ways to control supply chains, like electronic risk management and uh, uh, and all this leads at the end to resilience in, in times of crisis and pandemic. Um, I give you uh, two examples so you get uh, it's not too abstract uh, e-business can be or 
is often very abstract. I give you two examples and I looked for examples that are relevant for transition economies in developing countries. Um, also, uh, because Sophie mentioned, uh, an, an important aspect of e-business is to, uh, to, to bridge the, the digital divide. So one standard we have is, is called ECERT. It's a standard for electronic uh, licenses, uh, permits and certificates in agriculture trade. Uh, it's uh, recommended inter alia by the uh, IPPC as the global standard for electronic FITO certificates. Uh, but many countries also use it for uh, SPS certificates for, mish, uh, for meat, fishery products, dairy products, and so on. Electronic SPS are exchanged between the, the big players already uh, since quite a while. Uh, and they have greatly helped to, to reduce transaction costs, make trade uh, better, and uh, to increase, in, in increase the, the, to, to lead to better regulatory control. However, uh, the use of these electronic certificates was a bit uh, prohibitive for, for smaller countries. And therefore, the uh, uh, IPPC, together with the World Trade Organization in Geneva, uh, they developed, uh, next slide please, they developed an, what is called the eFITO hub. So the eFITO hub is, consists of two components. One component is a, is a generic system for a national competent authority uh, to fill in an electronic uh, uh, FITO certificate. And the second component is an exchange hub. So once uh, the authority has generated such a certificate, it can be electronically exchanged to other competent authorities. And um, there's also a bridge between this eFITO hub and the TRACES and T hub of the European Union. So a country connected to uh, the eFITO hub will also be able to exchange electronic certificates with the European Union. Just to give you an, an example, Uzbekistan recently uh, um, uh, uh, adopted this hub. Uh, they took, it took them only three months in order to get everything running. And today they're already exchanging uh, 4,000 uh, certificates with countries like Korea, uh, Germany, the US, uh, Russia, and so on. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, the next short example I want to show you is, is electronic uh, certificates for trade in international species of a wild flora and fauna, CITES convention. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, CITES um, has a, uh, if you could move to the next slide, please. Uh, CITES uh, trade is, uh, CITES is a problem that uh, illegal trade in international wildlife is the fourth biggest uh, uh, international crime. And so a lot of CITES permits and certificates are uh, tampered with, uh, are, are forged. So CITES set up a vision, a concept for an end-to-end -end control of uh, trade in endangered species using internet technology. If you could please uh, move on. Uh, yes, thank you. And so one of the components uh, of this strategic vision is uh, the cooperation with uh, the UNCTAD ASICUDA project to develop an, a cloud-based uh, tool for issuing and controlling of electronic CITES permits that can be used by management authorities this is the UNCTAD ASICUDA base solution. This system, as I said, is, is cloud-based. Uh, traders can actually request uh, uh, permits using mobile phones or any other uh, uh, stationary computer equipment. And even the government agencies can control uh, in a personless uh, manner the complete uh, workflow and the approval of this permit. These systems, the first country where it was implemented was Sri Lanka in February uh, of 2020. Very shortly after the inauguration of the system, uh, Sri Lanka had to go into a hard lockdown. All government agencies were closed. 
I talked uh, uh, in spring of last year, I talked to a trader and the trader told me before it was taking months and longer to get uh, uh, such a certificate and I would have to go several times to the management authority. Uh, with this new system, we had uh, uh, an, a zero disruption of, of our export procedures. And he said, without that system, uh, uh, they were exporting Nefentis, so that is uh, ornamental flowers. He said, I would have lost my uh, complete uh, uh, production. This so, minute, Marcus. yes, thank you. Uh, so, next slide. Uh, and this is basically what I just said. If you can go to the uh, final slide. So, what I, I wanted to uh, to show here is is the two main pillars uh, for electronic business. So it allows efficient controls and, uh, and, and supply chain operations, um, which is faster movement, less uh, waste of produce and paperless, uh, contactless clearance of goods. And um, the other, I think very important aspect is, and that was uh, said in the presentation of George before, uh, we've seen in the COVID pandemic uh, a disruption uh, in the supply chain. We have seen major shifts both on the production and on the consumption side, and that, that required a lot of changes in order to deal with this, uh, um, with this disruptions. And uh, electronic information and the possibility to use electronic systems that are acting on this electronic information uh, was uh, one of the pillars that kept international agriculture trade alive and still keeps it alive in, in, in the current pandemic. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Marcus. That's, that was also a good overview of various applications uh, uh, and, and, and ways of using, of making connectivity meaningful. Thank you so much. Uh, now, uh, let's move to a little bit different area uh, to Earth observations and to using all other type chunk of uh, technologies like satellites uh, for precision agriculture, etc. Uh, Douglas Kripe, a senior scientific advisor from uh, Intergovernmental Group on Earth observations with his presentation on GeoGlam. Okay, uh, thank you, Victor. Can you hear me okay? Perfect, loud and clear. Great, thanks so much for uh, inviting me to uh, participate in this webinar uh, on behalf of the uh, group on Earth observations. Uh, I just wanna talk uh, a little bit about, uh, in a first instance, the uh, um, Global Earth Observation uh, Agricultural Monitoring Initiative. Actually, it's a flagship of the of GEO. Uh, which, uh, as you may know, uh, GEO, the Group on Earth Observations, is an intergovernmental partnership of, uh, of over 100 countries and uh, participating organizations. And GEOGLAM is working to fight uh, food insecurity or, uh, markets through uh, the use of Earth observations, as, uh, as you just mentioned. The Group on Earth Observations Global Agricultural Monitoring uh, flagship was initially launched by the group of uh, 20 agricultural ministers in Paris in June 2011 as part of the minister's G20 action plan on food price volatility. And since 2011, uh, GeoGlam has expanded its focus to include a broader uh, uh, emphasis on global food security. GeoGlam uh, delivers on its mission by producing and openly disseminating consensus-based, relevant and timely and actionable information on agricultural conditions and outlooks of production at national, regional and global scales. And here you can see the final declaration from that uh, meeting in Paris in 2011 from the G20 agricultural ministers. GeoGlam uh, participants include representatives from most G20 nations as well as many other countries and several international organizations and NGOs. Participation is from more than 120 institutions and over 50 nations with beneficiaries from at least from least developed nations further expanding the reach of GeoGlam. The main product that GeoGlam initially um, uh, put forth was something called the crop monitor for the agri agricultural um, monitoring information system. And uh, this 
produces monthly crop uh, condition assessments for uh, wheat, maize, soybean, and rice. Um, the, uh, since 2012, GeoGlam information has covered uh, uh, Amos major importing and exporting countries, and the crop monitor encompasses over 80% of global production, consumption, and trade volumes of Amos targeted crops. Over 40 nations and institutions uh, contribute to the crop monitor. And then since uh, 2016, the crop monitor for early warning has monitored crops that are important for food security by region, generally encompassing countries and regions that are susceptible to food insecurity. And participants include the major food security organizations such as the World Food Program, FAO, USAID, FUSENET, uh, the Joint Research Center of um, the European Commission, Azer Rice, and others. Combined, the GeoGlam crop monitors covers most of the world. And here is an example of uh, that comes from the latest um, uh, crop monitor early warning for May, which shows conditions uh, across uh, Central and South Asia. And uh, in particular, we can see that um, conditions in Kazakhstan, for example, are uh, favorable for, for the uh, crops that are looking at. Uh, and uh, the uh, planting of spring wheat has continued across Kazakhstan, Afghanistan, Kyrgyzstan. Yeah. And then uh, the outlook uh, calls for below normal precipitation and above normal temperatures during May and June in parts of Central Asia. And we can see again that this is uh, the case in, in regions such as, as Kazakhstan. Now, what has been the impact of COVID on GeoGlam operations? Well, uh, according to the uh, GeoGlam report that is going to the G20 meeting uh, to be held later this summer, uh, the world is currently facing one of the greatest food emergencies in more than a generation. GeoGlam is monitoring uh, that global food insecurity and it is shown that it has risen due to the challenges associated with increasing conflict and the world's changing weather and climate conditions. Impacts from other events include floods, winds, and droughts, uh, and in across Africa, one of the worst waves of locusts uh, in uh, many, many years. What is different in 2020 is that COVID-19 has amplified the risks already facing the world's 690 million hungry people potentially doubling the population facing acute word uh, food shortages. That's from the World uh, Food um, WFP. A joint research center in Kenya indicated that 76% of the smallholder uh, farmers were impacted by pandemic measures affecting the availability of inputs, labor, transport, and cross-border trade, and compounded by the crop loss in 16% of farms due to the locust invasions. But in response to the evolving crude food crisis, the provision of objective and transparent near real time information on global agriculture was critical and GeoGlam rose to the challenge in 2020 and continues to do so in 2021 by, by providing state of the science information products to the Amos G20 community. In a year when much of the world was in some form of lockdown, the pandemic has demonstrated the importance of space-based observations to compensate for the reduction in near uh, in ground information to provide insights on the state and challenges of uh, producing crops in near real time. And importantly, technology in GeoGlam's response has been um, responsible for managing the human dimension. Because GeoGlam has established resilience and committed expert networks, uh, it has been able to rally the community to continue to deliver vetted consensus information to support food commodity markets without missing a step. So uh, to conclude here, um, GeoGlam participates in uh, providing a price prediction mechanism which reduces uh, market volatility by the use uh, or the production of its crop monitors, as you can see here on the left. That in combination with products uh, provided by Amos uh, such as the supply and demand and commodity price index uh, provides uh, market stability through authoritative, the provision of authoritative information uh, based on independent collaboration and real near time uh, assessment. So uh, with those comments, I conclude my presentation. Back to you, Victor. Thank you. Great. Uh... Douglas, specifically, you made it even shorter than your uh, assigned time slot was. 
Uh, thank you so much. And of course, all those uh, mechanisms, what you described, uh, crop monitoring and price prediction are so important, specifically in those challenging times we're at now. Uh, on that note, uh, let me uh, give the floor for our next speaker, uh, Dominic Berot, Head of Earth uh, System Monitoring Division at the World Meteorological Organization. Thank you very much, Victor, and thank you for having me here uh, to give you an overview on WMRO's activity in hydrological monitoring, specifically during that COVID situation. So WMRO, that's the World Meteorological Organization, uh, dealing with uh, uh, the UN Agency for Climate Weather and Water, or more specifically, uh, hydrological um, monitoring and operational hydrology. And um, that's quite important. So I, I do not have to convince you how important water is, not only for agriculture, but as well for hydropower, for navigation, for ecosystems and so on. So we, we have to act. And the SDG number six on water is absolutely clear on this. But it's so difficult to act to, to take the right decision in terms of operation, ir irrigation schemes, in terms of infrastructure, because the system is still very much unknown. So the, the whole hydrological cycle, uh, as you'll see at the bottom of this um, picture, is still unknown. So we, we just cannot probably understand the system and we cannot model the system probably and we need more monitoring. And that's the key. Having observations of the system can allow to, to build that value chain and to take the right decision. And we know for a long time that we need to, to increase the monitoring system of water all around the world. I'm talking about surface water, rivers, groundwater, and without forgetting the ocean, by the way. And you see from that picture, there is only a few countries that have a proper water observing system and that are not sharing that system to all the stakeholders. And that was an issue even before the COVID situation. And it was clear to us that we have to improve that situation. And the COVID situation for, for more than a year now uh, has pretty much shown that there are strong limitations and that we have to improve the situation. And you see uh, this um, um, result from a survey that in many cases, hydrometeorological services dealing with climate, weather, and water are facing huge challenges uh, due to uh, COVID-19 and have severe a restriction of all the services they provide to population due to COVID. Um, you see um, all colors but gray are uh, where we, you have issues for, for, for mild, moderate, and too strong issues, and especially numerical predictions that allow for uh, weather predictions are very much restricted due to COVID. So it was clear we have to act and to accelerate all we are doing in terms of digitalization to, to, to ensure that we are stronger on, on, on more robust in, for, for the next uh, pandemic or, or whatever natural hazard that can happen. And that's even more true for specifically hydrology and specifically true for, for the, the region we are here, so um, Central Asia and, and um, Eastern Europe, uh, on that short survey from last year showed that um, most of the countries are facing difficulty in delivering hydrological services and data, data products, forecast, warning systems. Uh, on one of the reasons being that the field work is not possible. And field work is important for getting to the stations, measuring stations, because still many stations are not automatized. Uh, it's on paper, on, you need observers to, to go on the site to take the measure. And that's not only expensive, time consuming, but in, in, in case of a crisis, um, including a, a pandemic, you just cannot go in the field. And that's an issue we have to solve. And the other issue being that for most of the countries, uh, there is huge uncertainties in terms of budgeting for operation and maintenance of the network. So it's a clear sign we have to be more efficient 
and, and to, to provide more support in terms of um, digitized solutions, automatic uh, solutions. And that's actually what the WMO is trying to do for years now, especially building a new generation of water monitoring. And we started that long before the, the COVID, but the COVID was a clear sign we have to accelerate that. So you saw some presentation dealing with herbs. So we also have a hub on, uh, it's called the Hydro Hub, um, building the new generation of water monitoring uh, and with an innovation hub um, aiming at um, finding um, additional solution to the say standard measurements, thanks to a new technology, low-cost technology, citizen observations, a satellite information as shown by the crime just before me. And we, we have to, to make sure that we can improve the, the all information flux on the water uh, thanks to that new generation of, um, of uh, devices and uh, monitoring approaches. And uh, we, are, we are working much more um, currently in uh, different African regions but very much open to, to, to discuss uh, as well with partners for, for Asia and the Eastern Europe. You will see some examples in a, in a few minutes. And a concrete example is uh, when we're talking about um, data sharing, um, we are building what we call the WHOS, the WMO Hydrological Observing System, uh, which is an automatization of data transmission. So as soon as you have the data that are collected um, on, the, on the database, uh, you can be sure that you can transmit all the data to any kind of user or stakeholders you are uh, in, your, in your region, in your country, uh, all around the world, thanks to that um, whose system, uh, without any burden on question on data formatting or on any kind of um, uh, data quality, whatever we can deal with this and making sure we have that value chain from the data to uh, the applications, including from private sector or, or universities or other um, national agencies, agriculture, uh, na uh, natural hazard, and so on and so forth. Um, and that's what I call a success of digitalizations, not having any burden anymore of getting to the in the field for, for getting paper or whatever solutions to have all solutions here in one hand and that's provided by the WMO. And um, more than that, we are developing based on those data that are collected, what we call the hydrological status and outlook system, hydro SOS, which is producing information for the current situation of all the world, and as well for a kind of outlook or, or what's, what could be coming in the next days or weeks or even month on the, are they drop um, expected somewhere in the world? Are, are they flood situation expected? And that the Hydro SOS uh, provide that. It's by the National Hydromet Services or for the National Hydromet Services with all possible stakeholders around the world. So on that thanks to digitalizations, you can reach that kind of, uh, of services. It's not only useful for the users, but it's useful as well to, to, to gain visibility to ministries and, and so on to, to show that, that what we can do for hydrology in terms of uh, services for any kind of stakeholders. Uh, a few examples on what we are doing with partners all around the, the, the region, uh, starting with um, starting years ago, a, a multi-hazard early warning system in Southeast uh, Europe with uh, at least 10 countries uh, on the, hopefully some of the countries that are uh, here uh, at that webinar. Um, we started together with the USAID, a modern, modernization of the Afghan Hydromet service. Uh, including um, forecast system uh, on digitalization of all the, the, the measurement networks. Um, um, a Swiss consortium called IMRMO developed um, a new type of uh, water level monitoring system for Kyrgyzstan that was conceived and built in Kyrgyzstan and especially for measuring um, irrigation channels, water level velocity, and then um, conveying that kind of information into a database then for, for, for decision makers. And the, it's a good news for me having 
an, uh, an institute in Kyrgyzstan able to, to build that kind of devices. And we are right now working with uh, Caritas, um, a Swiss NGO, uh, to build local climate services for farmers uh, in Tajikistan. So it just has been funded by the, the Swiss government and that will help uh, local farmers to, to take the better decisions thanks to uh, weather, water and climate services at the local scales and linked to what the, the national authorities are, are doing. And so my, my final slide, just to tell that we need to build that value chain and digitalizations from the data collections to the decisions and to the, the, the final users, being populations, being farmers, being uh, decision makers, can help this. And WMO, working with um, many different partners, is uh, happy to, to support all these uh, efforts. And I think that's my last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dominic. That, that's uh, great to know. I mean, no need to, to persuade us that water is so important for agriculture. And it's great to have you on board in this uh, area, in this sector, and delivering all those great services to different level of stakeholders, including farmers, and making it available to them. Uh, I can see that all those questions, a variety and the multiple questions we have having coming from audience are well answered and well handled by, by speakers and by our team members. And I invite all the questions to still come in and we will try to answer them. Uh, in, and I invite speakers also just to try to contribute to that actively and like to give the floor to Sophie Trainen, who will be leading, leading the discussion panel with the other representatives uh, coming from this very important and very relevant and very timely uh, sector, such as digitalization of agriculture in the region. Sophie. Thank you very much, uh, Victor. So we will have now a panel discussion and we have invited some uh, colleagues uh, from uh, FAO. Um, we have Navana, Nevena Alexandrova Stefanovna, uh, who, will, uh, who is an agriculture extension officer in uh, H quarter, and she knows very well the region because uh, she worked uh, uh, in uh, Europe and Central Asia for many years. We also will have with us uh, Mark uh, Ovari, who is uh, an animal health uh, preparedness expert, and um, he will tell us more about capacity development and what was uh, needed to be done during this COVID time. Then we have um, people representing the private, the public sector, and this will be the case of Leila Agazada. Um, and she is working in Azerbaijan and she will present us uh, the platform that is being developed and has been accelerated during the COVID time. Then we have another uh, representative from a country, uh, Vito Gujica, who is uh, representing the academia sector as he is a professor at the University of East uh, Sarajevo. And then we have a representative from uh, the private sector from Russia. This is um, Ilya Skabara, uh, who is the, the vice president of cognitive technologies. So we will discover uh, how uh, um, artificial intelligence is being applied to agriculture. So without any further ado, I will invite uh, Nevena uh, to join us. Um, and I would be pleased uh, to uh, actually discover a little bit more what has been done uh, during uh, this pandemic, because the extension uh, unit uh, of FAO has run a series of webinars, and uh, I know that digitalization was one aspect of it. So what are the lessons learned, Mervena? Thank you. Thank you very much, Sophie, for inviting me to share some experiences from Research and Extension Unit of the Office of Innovation and the headquarters in Rome. So since the beginning of the pandemic, extension and advisory services have been a major contributor to the COVID-19 response, bridging much needed information from and to the field. And yet, extension and advisory services around the world are very seriously challenged to transform themselves and adapt to remote and digital delivery. So in the 
period May June uh, 2020, uh, our unit produced um, uh, some policy briefs uh, related to extension and also research and uh, innovation systems that I will share in a moment. And also have conducted series of regional webinars in Asia, Europe and Central Asia and Africa, and uh, with the aim to understand how different extension and advisory services providers and uh, pluralistic systems uh, at national level are coping with the new normal and how they are innovating under different circumstances, lockdowns or recovery scenarios, and in a very uneven and um, also specific regional uh, context. The webinars aimed at identifying and advocating for such innovations in extension within the regions and also to act as a platform for rapid knowledge and exchange uh, between those regions. So, as you said, we have analyzed several aspects uh, coming out of this uh, knowledge brought by um, the webinars and additional research. In particular, in the case of uh, the remote and digital delivery of advisory services. So most of the countries, including in, in this region, reported an increased uh, application of digital tools in extension. However, those tools are, were not precision agriculture. So those were primarily used as an alternative to face-to-face -to -face communication to maintain the contact with the clients and provide services and learning through mobile phone chats and video exchange applications through SMS or uh, interactive voice um, uh, uh, recording, uh, social media, online platforms, but also traditional uh, ICTs like radio and TV channels. And although the remote delivery was not the unique mode of service provision uh, and advice, uh, advisors also went to the field, uh, but it is uh, surprising that the communication flow between the farmers and advisors that was mainly, again, uh, remote, um, increased up to 50%. So a large part uh, of this increase was due to the use of digital tools and um, uh, ICTs. And uh, to cope with the, the challenge of closing the farmer markets, there, there were many emerging emerging trends like uh, in digital tools, like uh, developing of uh, commercial online platforms in many countries, including in, in the region, for instance, North Macedonia, Hungary, Greece, that were not only linked to uh, uh, selling of the agriculture produce, but also um, uh, helping um, uh, employment, um, um, information. Um, also, uh, it was uh, noted that advisory services uh, had a great contribution to these online platforms to uh, um, help farmers um, provide data on the platforms, but also to um, engage them to, to collaborate uh, and form clusters. In the recovery period, uh, what has been noticed is an increased uh, um, uh, demand for uh, social um, uh, financial instruments um, and uh, also uh, more knowledge through online platforms. But uh, so we have analyzed um, the, the champions examples. We also noted that in a great number of uh, cases, the advisory services just stopped working in uh, the, um, the lockdown uh, period, especially in the first three to four months in some countries. So a great number of farmers uh, did not uh, um, have an access to services in this period. And this is due to infrastructure and also policy issues. So our key message would be uh, that policies relate and investments uh, related to extension and advisory services, digitalization, and maybe framed in a, in a policy, overall policy of agricultural innovation are pertinent to um, continue uh, capitalize on uh, digitalization and uh, cope with COVID pandemic. Thank you. 
And Nevena, I know that uh, during uh, the pandemic, um, there was also this publication. So very shortly, because we are running out of time, could you explain uh, what is this uh, publication from Space to Farm and how the small orders can really benefit from that, even in the COVID time? Thank you, Sophie. So we know that COVID-19 brought an uncertainty in the food supply chains. But we also know from experience, especially in this part of the world, uh, during the um, economic uh, uh, transition to market economies, that uh, small farmers and uh, family farms were very uh, instrumental, pertinent to cope with the, the economic crisis. So there is a potential here, uh, an unutilized potential for smallholders to uh, um, contribute to the response uh, and decrease the uncertainty of uh, for the supply chains but there is a problem uh, in many countries small farms are often out of the radar of the official records and statistics so this potential could not be evaluated and capitalized therefore on so they Project SALSA, uh, it's a Horizon 2020 project to which uh, FAO contributed, and I had the pleasure to lead this effort from FAO side, had developed an innovative metho methodology to identify and characterize uh, small farms using open source, free of charge satellite data from um, the Copernicus program and satellite, satellite uh, um, Sentinel uh, uh, one and two missions data have been used to assess uh, um, the crop types and link them to um, the distribution and acreage of the farms. And uh, of course, uh, the, the different spectrum uh, one were analyzed, uh, machine learning was used, and also a farmer survey. Uh, and uh, official statistics to verify the data. And this is how this methodology was then used for policy purposes, policy recommendations in uh, several European uh, regions and also two African regions um, uh, were produced. Uh, that's in, uh, indeed very interesting how this, uh, what we can learn from this, um, how to apply this methodology. And indeed what we can have is to um, have more data and understanding on agroecological landscape, on the crop distribution, on the yield expectations, on how to um, do better decision making on the field, how extension services could be more efficient in their um, advices. Also, uh, for policy making to um, empower further smallholders. And this uh, data again that is very um, it's cost efficient to use because we have the methodology and it's uh, free of charge data um, saves a lot of time of um, uh, normally uh, data collection that would be done through surveys uh, etc and this is why we believe it's very instrumental uh, in the COVID-19 recovery thank you Thank you very much, Nevena. This is really useful because this is really showing also the diversity of approaches uh, from simple uh, use of social media, SMS, to something which is more sophisticated, uh, like a satellite uh, information and data. So now I would like to um, show another aspect, and this aspect is related to, to capacity development. Uh, in FAO, we are doing a lot of uh, training workshop. Capacity development is a very important aspect of our work. And most of the time, we are doing this face-to-face. -face. However, uh, during the pandemic, um, our team, uh, E-Trade team, uh, the, the animal health team, they face the same issue. We had to find another solution. So I'm inviting Mark Ovari, who is uh, from uh, our animal health uh, unit, to explain how they responded uh, to um, the pandemic in changing uh, their strategy. Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you for your invitation to be on this panel and the opportunity to share our experience on this 
four week long all night training on African swine fever. Um, so to summarize, probably um, what is the main difference in terms of preparation um, compared to a face-to-face -face training and an online training? Um, so interestingly, many aspects are quite similar. Um, there are some key differences that I would like to highlight. So just as with face-to-face -face, um, trainings, we define an aim and the learning objectives, um, which guide us throughout the course. Now, when it comes to the creation of the content, the time spent on the training material is much longer uh, than compared to face-to-face -face events. Um, it is on one hand to ensure uh, to have optimal standardization of the material. And as we're talking about interactive modules where people click on the various slides, uh, the sequencing of self-test questions and proper writing style, because in case of online learning, we use full sentences rather than bullet points because we don't have an audio component when we interact with the participants. Um, and of course, once all the technical aspects have been uh, set, then it takes time for an instructional designer to create the modules and we still sort out the last glitches, um, buttons working and, and, and these sorts. Um, and of course, we set everything in a training environment. It means that participants enter the web page uh, where they find the training modules, but it is more than that. Uh, we provide um, and have created um, webinars at the beginning of the course and at the end of the course. We have created short video material on subjects where they wanted to have a better understanding. And also we maintain a discussion forum, which is our main platform to interact with the participants. They can ask questions on the sub subject matter, which in our case was African swine fever. And we also engage them with various smaller exercises to um, ensure uh, them um, to learn the material in a, in a more deeper way. Um, then if we think about what are the benefits of digitalization of a, of a course, as mentioned, the standardization, that's a very important aspect, um, but also it's the sheer scale. While in case of a face-to-face -face training, we would be able to train 20 to 30 participants. Um, in case of these tutored online trainings, uh, we can um, train between 350 and 400 participants. Um, and also because our course was tutored, we still have maintained connection with them as mentioned through the discussion forum. Um, apart from the numbers, uh, the other benefits include um, adaptation to various languages, adaptations to local needs. So the course that we have developed um, for African Spanish Fever for Europe has been adapted in other regions um, in Asia and Pacific, Latin America and the Caribbean, and also one will be coming up for South Africa. So we're rather proud about the, this achievement. So this is also very nice because when it's when well done, then it can be uh, replicated more easily and scaled up in, in other regions. Uh, so this is a, a very good uh, lessons learned. And also what you said about uh, being digital takes more time, more preparation. Uh, yes, but uh, in the long run, uh, it pays off because uh, more can uh, take advantage of it. So I know that uh, in some cases, these uh, two church training, they can also be uh, converted uh, into MOOCs. This is uh, what uh, we will be doing with uh, our course on uh, experience capitalization. And uh, of course, we should never underestimate um, this. Did you face any issues of uh, connectivity with um, your participants, Mark? Or was this okay? Yeah, thank you for, for your question. So based on our experience in Europe, so we have run one course for Europe, um, the entire Europe, there wasn't any issues. And also we had a local adaptation for the Balkan region. Um, 
connection, we didn't experience major connection issues, uh, but to circumvent any issues, all of our training modules, so the learning content was also available in a handout downloadable format. So Excellent. for those who had maybe had a problem of running the interactive courses, they could just download it in a PDF and study the material. Ah, yes, that's very good advice. That's, these are good tips to have uh, the course available in different formats, interactive lessons, uh, downloadable PDF and things like that. Um, and um, I was wondering, did you need to have, um, because you need a certain level of digital skills. So um, was this an issue or most of your learners were had the appropriate digital skills? Oh, you right. were so, having a, a support, special support service. Right, so, for, so thank you that this is a very important question. Um, so from, um, from our side, so from the platform side, we collaborated with other partners uh, to have our forced uh, courses developed. So I think that there are two ways to approach it. Either you build your infrastructure yourself, you take small steps and after, investing maybe a couple of years, you would have to put infrastructure, the capacity to run a course. The other solution is to partner up with somebody who has already a built out infrastructure, has the know-how and how to create these materials, how to moderate um, an, an online course. This is what we did. So we partnered up with others. Uh, we learned a lot through this experience and actually we want to engage more on our regional level to, to have more of this infrastructure and know-how built in, in in our environment. So we are more um, you know, independent. Um. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. I think that um, uh, this topic about capacity development and also how we should uh, move uh, from face to face to online, but uh, in a more interactive way uh, is something that will be uh, the focus of our uh, next uh, webinar specifically devoted to that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so now let's move into uh, the public sector. And um, uh, we have invited uh, Leila Agaza from uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, Leila is working um, as a project manager on a very interesting initiative from the government. So Leila, could you please tell us a few words on this initiative? Uh, first of all, hello. Uh, thank you for the speech, great speech. Uh, in our public sector, uh, government sector, we are doing uh, the electronic version of the agricultural system, uh, which was uh, already started to improving uh, from 2019. And now we are also improving this uh, system with turning uh, the physical processes to the electronic one. Um, and yes, and um, so because of the pandemic, what you had started doing was accelerated. And uh, now you're uh, analyzing what was done physically so that you can uh, convert them electronically. And what are the challenges that uh, you have been facing uh, during uh, the pandemic to do this? Yeah, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we had this system before the pandemic. Like uh, this is the electronic agricultural information system, which is eagro uh, was one of the goals that already existed before the pandemic and was to be improved. In other words, even before the pandemic, farmers could easily apply for the subsidies and we could carry out the processes through the system without physical uh, contact. However, the pandemic has had a major impact on this digitalization process. This process consists of the farmer entering the zone area into the system, reporting the planting, uh, and also inspecting the air, this area with satellite monitoring with a crop map by the operator after the farmers apply for the subsidy. Like the field inspection process is carried out in, the, uh, in this case uh, if there is any problem. And if the subsidies is approved, 
then the farmer cards are ordered through the system again. And each of these process is carried out entirely through the Iagro system without physical intervention. Uh, in addition, uh, during the pandemic, work permits were also issued through the system, like uh, about 400,000 farmers through the system uh, get their work permits uh, during the strict quarantine periods. Like um, in addition to this, uh, also a number of uh, other improvements has been made uh, to the system in order to increase the user friendliness in general, like such as um, such changes also have been made not only for farmers, but also for uh, panels for uh, operators, veterinarians, artificial insemination specialists. Like these changes uh, have helped accelerating the process of digitalization in Azerbaijan during the COVID-19 pandemic times. Like uh, during the pandemic also, we uh, faced some difficulties, but the fact that uh, the IAGRO as system uh, already exists before the pandemic uh, is in working order has made most of the things easier for us. Like these problems only arose during the physical processes, such as sales, uh, deliveries, also field, uh, field inspection processes, uh, like, I would like to also briefly inform you that uh, access to the IAGRO system is carried out with uh, ASAN login, in which case the user must have registered in the ASAN login system before entering the IAGRO as system. During the pandemic, farmers uh, who were not registered in the ASAN login system had some problems connecting to the IAGRO. Uh, this process also was organized by mobile buses of Assam service. Um, another problem was like uh, the delivery of uh, farmer cards to the farmers uh, with as little contact as possible, like, which was achieved uh, by mobile buses delivering the cards even to their homes without contacting. This also helped farmers to get their farmer cards without having to go to the banks, to the city or district centers. Um, yeah, this was uh, all uh, problems. Also, uh, in order to reduce the contact during the pandemic, mobile sales and deliveries of fertilizers uh, and similar sales also were uh, performed, were organized by the uh, by these buses, and we decreased the uh, reduced the contact during the pandemic with uh, these processes. So this is very interesting because uh, you have uh, found very innovative approaches to uh, reply to all these challenges. And um, uh, for people who had then difficulties in logging in, you also have a, a call center where people can uh, get advice on uh, how to proceed on the platform. Is that correct? Uh, yes, uh, we have uh, contact uh, uh, call centers and support centers established within the Ministry of Agriculture of the Republic of Azerbaijan. They uh, try to help uh, solve problems and answer uh, questions that users face uh, both before pandemic or during the pandemic. Okay, so thank you very much for uh, this example from uh, Azerbaijan and uh, from Caucasus region. Now let's move to the Western Balkan. And uh, we are now uh, welcoming uh, Vitso Grujica, uh, who is a professor at the University of uh, Sarajevo. Um, Vitso is also uh, working uh, with FAO on um, the preparation of the digital agricultural strategy uh, for uh, the country. And Vitso is really uh, traveling everywhere in Bosnia Herzegovina, and uh, he is really the specialist on uh, digitalization in agriculture. So uh, Vitso, with all um, this experience and with your view as a professor, how uh, your country 
has replied uh, to the pandemic with digitalization. Thank you, Sophie. Yes. Greetings, greetings from Bosnia. Uh, thank you for invitation to be for panelist on this uh, webinar. Uh, the Bosnia is, as you mentioned, the Bosnia is one of the country where the FAO launched the activities focused on e agriculture development. If we are looking for any positive impact of COVID-19 uh, pandemic in Bosnia and Herzegovina, in agriculture and of course rural areas, we can find it in uh, two sectors. One of them is, is uh, agritourism and uh, digitalization. From one side, during the pandemic, people were looking for destination in nature. We had a fully lockdown in April and May, May last year. We had summer temperature in uh, that time. The borders were closed. Rural destination were the uh, only uh, solution for the, the people. Uh, this was not the case uh, before the, the pandemic. Today, we, we have a lot of uh, different uh, initiatives, uh, projects uh, uh, focused on the rural tourism, uh, linking uh, agriculture with the uh, tourism sector. Uh, it, is, um, it is direction where the small holders, small agricultural farmers in rural area uh, can find uh, can find they, they, their their uh, business strategies. In addition, uh, on the other on the other hand, the pandemic pandemic has accelerated uh, digitalization. Uh, this is the case. This is case within the almost all sectors, uh, both uh, public and private, like uh, education, like. Um, uh, communication, trade, and uh, etc. Uh, the phrase work from home uh, was introduced in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina just uh, last year. The Hello. 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 Uh, do you Please go me? ahead. Go ahead, Vitzo. Yes. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, the, this, uh, this phrase uh, knows. Uh, uh, both younger and older older people. Um, when we are talking uh, for the digitalization in the agricultural sector, I would like to highlight the e-commerce. Before the pandemic, there, uh, there were just a few, I, uh, I can say, general e-commerce platforms in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, but uh, more new solutions, uh, were launched last year during the pandemic period. For instance, a new, uh, a few uh, bigger, bigger uh, retail chains uh, introduced, launched uh, online platforms for ordering and also delivering. Um, new, uh, there, there was there are a few new uh, specialized. Uh, online platforms for the agricultural products and also food uh, foodstuffs. Uh, the small agricultural producers uh, are using social networks like uh, Facebook or, or Viber. For instance, uh, there is a livestock market of Bosnia and Herzegovina group on Facebook with uh, more than, at the moment, more than uh, 13,000 uh, members. It was launched in December last year. Um, from the other side, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown the key limitation of limitations in the rural area in terms of uh, digitalization. Uh, on the first place, I would like to mention uh, ICT infrastructure. We heard today on the beginning of uh, the beginning of even the term digital uh, villages. The, I think the ICT infrastructure uh, in rural areas is one of the key uh, condition or precondition for uh, digital, digital transfer, the transformation in rural areas. Uh, we have in Bosnia, now we have uh, some villages uh, without 
without uh, GSM network. Uh, the second one is depopulation. Young people um, moving to the cities. We know uh, for both for uh, diversification in rural area, including agriculture, and for digital transformation, uh, the key key people is young people. But we uh, we 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 have uh, less and less young people in rural areas. I think that is the 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 key uh, key limitations, key constraints for uh, additional uh, digital transformation and. It is few reasons uh, why we started with a national e-agriculture strategy. Yes, and maybe you can just uh, to finalize, uh, when is this strategy going to be live or, and how is it embedded in the other strategies of uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina? Uh, at the moment, you know, uh, you, you know, Sophie. At the moment, we are uh, on the uh, we are finalizing our uh, national strategy, and in the future period, from uh, 2021 uh, to 26 or 27, seven at the moment, the uh, the, the government sector are uh, creating the general agricultural strategy. What? can be uh, the best solution. The best solution, I think, will be if uh, the, the government sector uh, will include uh, the priorities, the findings, the recommendations from e-national agri strategy to uh, embedded, embedded to, to uh, agricultural strategy, of, of course, and rural development. I do fully agree with you. Uh, things should be embedded and not only in one sector, but uh, in different sectors. The yes. strategy of the Ministry of Agriculture, of the telecoms, uh, rural development. Uh, so it's a, a system approach, as uh, we like to say. So, and I have to tell you also good luck because uh, the 9th of June, there will be a validation workshop uh, with all the stakeholders. So it's also um, uh, a, a, a long process but that will uh, produce good results thank you very much vitso uh, from uh, showing this perspective and also the reconnection to nature and uh, uh, rural areas not only um, agriculture now my last speaker is uh, from the private sector and um, I'm very pleased uh, to have Ilya with us because uh, this is something different it is uh, mm -hmm artificial intelligence. And it's so to see um, what does artificial intelligence uh, do for us uh, in the agriculture sector and uh, how this, the private sector and artificial intelligence uh, was a reply to COVID-19 pandemic. Ilya, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Sophie. Uh, I'm happy to represent here uh, a, co a company which started uh, 25 years ago, uh, uh, research and development and computer vision and cognitive technologies. Uh, our company two years ago launched uh, AgroPilot. It was a new field for us before we work with uh, Hyundai Mobility, and uh, we take part at, uh, as, a, uh, as a builder for uh, automotive autopilot and uh, we produce uh, co-pilots for railroads companies and uh, uh, on ba and ba which and we based on this uh, solutions we built uh, inexpensive and user user friendly device for agriculture uh, today we have 1,000 agropilot in use in Russia, in the European Union, North and South America. Uh, as a transfer technology to agrotech, uh, it was a very interesting situation uh, when what we have seen during the pandemic. The first one uh, is a critical situation with seasonal workers and as a result, huge dem demand on automatization in agriculture. 
The second one is a big problem with components. Even our company feels that. But fortunately, we found uh, partners in Germany, in Eastern Europe, and now we can produce our agro, agro pilot as an international uh, and as an international uh, device. Uh, what agro pilot can help? How agro pilot can help with uh, uh, situation uh, in a pandemic? The first one, it's uh, increase daily output and reduce labor cost. Uh, modern combine harvester is bigger than the house where my grandmother was born 100 years ago. Uh, it's expensive and difficult to manage asset. Uh, in reality, uh, our, our solution, uh, AgroPilot, can help farmers, even that haven't any experience with harvesters, to manage it and use it. Uh, and it's like a uh, transfer technology from other sector, like a, like a automatic automatic speed shift for uh, auto industry. Yeah, it's uh, create a new mobility. Uh, same agropilot create a new possibility, new opportunity for farmers. As Sophie said before, a lot of uh, landlords in the European Union have a small uh, plot of land and for these uh, farmers uh, is uh, doesn't uh, economic sense to buy uh, expensive big but highly efficient equipment as a result agropilot give possibility to share this technique between the farmers uh, and we in reality can use sharing model and sharing an economy and uh, even for one or two days use, farmer can uh, use it with uh, agropilot. Uh, the next one, the main uh, difference between our solution and uh, well-known solution from which based on GPS, agropilot uh, use computer vision for recognition obstacles, people, animals, and other techniques, uh, technique, uh, techniques on the field. As a result, uh, we increase safety in agro sector, uh, we increase productivity, and we reduce uh, fuel consumption and uh, reduce a uh, footprint, uh, carbon footprint. And of course, it's a good impact uh, to, to sustainable development. Uh, I hope uh, that the uh, FAO will be our provider uh, with our solution. And of course, I call all people who are interesting for use that uh, to cooperation, uh, to contact. Uh, I will uh, put a link to our present full presentation uh, uh, to, to the chat. And thank you very much uh, to invite us to this very interesting meeting. Um, just uh, uh, to, to see that uh, the pandemic for you then was, uh, for your business, was just confirmation that you should pr pr continue and this has increased demand? Yeah, yeah. Pandemic showed us that uh, we are on the right way. Okay, because you are replying to specific uh, needs that are there. So uh, with this presentation, uh, we are looking from small to bigger farmers, from private sector to public sector, to research, to actually academia, but uh, uh, also uh, the different varieties of uh, how the digital technologies can be applied. Um, I will just do my um, summary of the panel in my uh, closing uh, words. So I will give the floor now to Victor, um, maybe to summarize the main points um, of the webinar. And um, I will uh, compliment you just after that. The floor is yours, Victor. Great, Sophie. Uh, 
Uh, what what a what a great uh, session, I must say. It's uh, really we when we were planning, we were trying to uh, this this event, we were trying to cover as many uh, factors as possible, and I I I think we have succeeded in a certain way because what we had heard from this was not only versatile and diverse impact on, of COVID uh, on, on agriculture in different sectors, but also by different types of responses. We have heard about connectivity as a very important prerequisite of uh, digitalization and uh, may bring in those digital technologies uh, from public sector and from the private sector. And not only connectivity itself, but later we have heard many examples of making that connectivity meaningful coming from different uh, regions, uh, different parts of our region, uh, Rio region, uh, European Union examples, and including uh, other uh, multiple examples from Central Asia, from Caucasus, from Balkans. We have heard uh, diverse uh, uh, points and viewpoints from different uh, stakeholders, starting with public, uh, international organizations, intergovernmental organizations, and national uh, institutions, governments, academia, and of course, uh, some uh, more uh, field related examples, what we, what we have uh, collected. Uh, we, we also learned about different technologies, how they can be used, starting with different certificates with, uh, as was um, outlined by uh, UNSA presentation, with different global satellite technologies, as it was outlined by um, uh, WMO and by uh, Geo Secretariat. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I've been off, you've heard all those examples well. I don't want to spend time on this now. Uh, it was really great. As, and what I liked and enjoyed the most indeed was the discussion at the end and your questions, reading uh, your questions and reading your answers. That was also great. And I learned a lot myself being in this field and working in the field and being really uh, involved in this. I can't stop learning more and more things myself. Uh, because of beauty of technologies and how it's developing uh, on a daily basis and evolving. And it's one of the beauty and I learned myself a lot. I hope it was the same with everyone else. Sophie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Victor. Um, I see that the interest is high because I see all the questions and answers. Um, I invite uh, the speakers and the panelists uh, who feel uh, comfortable in replying to some of these questions because these, uh, some of these questions are really addressed to you to do so, uh, so that uh, we can really um, take this into account. Uh, because I uh, realize that we need to do a kind of little report uh, after uh, this webinar taking into account the, the questions, but also uh, the answers uh, provided. Um, digitalization is everywhere. Some people were asking, but what it is, it is uh, the use of all these technologies. And uh, we have seen that during the pandemic, it's not the most sophisticated technology that help people, but sometimes it was the most simple. Uh, Nevena, Vizzo, others have mentioned just Viber, WhatsApp, uh, social media. This was um, the fast answer uh, to the need to be connected. And also um, what is important is all the human dimension that uh, we, we have heard today. We, uh, even if we have tried to replace the face-to-face -face interaction with digitalization, there are still things that require our physical contacts to really be engaged and um, be able to talk to each other and demonstrate each other. So uh, maybe now after the, the pandemic, of course, digitalization will be embedded uh, more fully in what we are doing. Teleworking will be part of the, the new way uh, of working, but we will also uh, really identify that when we have face-to-face, -face, we have to take advantage of that 
that uh, they are important. There are things that we don't need to do face to face, but we can then value and really uh, share uh, th this important moment. Uh, what we realize is that um, this pandemic has accelerated the digital technologies, but also the disparities, uh, because even if in places um, like rural areas where there was already connectivity, the increase of the demand didn't provide a good quality service. So this is still issues that uh, need to be um, taken into consideration. And um, infrastructure is key. And so this is uh, something that has to be done, but then it's also the, uh, the availability of uh, practical, simple tools, very important. Um, and um, digital technologies uh, are tools, they are not a magic stick. Uh, and this is why I really appreciated also the um, participation from Azerbaijan saying that we are looking at our process to see how we can digitalize them. So it's not digitalization that is going to solve all the issues. Uh, the issues have to be solved also in a systematic and a system approach. And the digital technologies are tools to uh, re resolve that. So um, this system approach in a sustainable way. Uh, this was also a comment that uh, I've seen. Um, we should, uh, why the, the, all the, the elements that are in these digital technologies, um, they are limited on earth. So we have to also make a sustainable use of these technologies and the technologies are not always the solutions to all the problems. So it's really to select well which tool, whether digital or not, to use for a specific problem, because we have to look at the, all the dimension of sustainability, environmental, social, and financial, economic. Um, so we had many examples um, and uh, we mentioned to you that uh, FAO has three regional initiative in the region, uh, which is about the small orders and family farming, then it's on the, the trade and the value chain, and then more about the, the natural resources, environment and climate change. And we have tried uh, to look at all these aspects uh, today. And we have seen examples for small holders and family farming. And um, Nevena, um, I think, will also uh, publish uh, soon uh, a document about uh, really the, the learnings and uh, the learnings on digitalization uh, in, in extension. Um, we have seen um, the, what are the platform that can be done I had question about, oh, do you have a regional platform? There are plenty of different platforms uh, and you have to find the platforms that um, fit uh, your uh, needs, uh, who, depending who you are. Uh, for farmers platform, this is more at the national level. There are international platforms like the e-agriculture community of practice. I mentioned in uh, some of the uh, comments, uh, the answers, uh, the sheep platform for small order innovation. But you know, these platforms, they can work only if you do contribute. So I don't think that people should say, oh, I'm going to do that to find a solution. You are part of the solution and you have to contribute. And uh, that's why it should be participative. And uh, so this is also an invitation to uh, really um, get engaged in, in these platforms. Uh, we have seen that artificial intelligence uh, can be a reply. And one of the things uh, I heard also is the importance of uh, sharing machinery. It's not only in an individual use, it's something, it's collective use. So uh, I know that in the region, the cooperative connotation is not great. However, uh, people can make good use of these technologies if there is more collaboration, if there is a sharing of these technologies. And there are plenty of solutions this way. Uh, also, um, 
a farmer does not need to, to know everything. The extension agents, the, the advisory services are there. So solutions are there and they, they can be shared. So these are um, another thing which is important to know. Um, we have seen everywhere the growing importance of uh, e-commerce. Um, and uh, what was nice, it was really to make the connection between producers and consumers. Uh, and then when you go further, when we want to have trade, uh, the importance of having uh, standards and um, all the work that is being done on this is uh, quite useful. In FAO, IFITO is one of uh, the, the, the standard that we are using for safety. So this is something that we will continue working. And then there, there is all these platform for monitoring weather, water, soil, uh, to understand the climate change, uh, to increasing resilience, to be to react to uh, other uh, crises. So you see, we have tackled all these things. And um, what I really liked um, also in what we heard, during the pandemic, people needed to reconnect to nature. And um, it also showed the digital divide in rural areas, so to importance to improve it, but then realize also, and this is our other things that we are doing in FAO, it's uh, the, the, the in heritage in agriculture to make connection between rural development, gastronomy and culture in heritage in uh, agriculture. This will also support the work that we are doing in uh, having smart villages, but linking smart cities and smart villages and uh, to also promote more what is available. So um, you remember the few words, making active, accessible connectivity, affordable, the, co the cost adaptable, the content and the, and the, the context actionable, uh, to have the capacity, the skills, the confidence, the trust, uh, but this can be done only if it's people-centered, being done in partnership, having specific process, and not being um, afraid of also sharing um, failures, because we are uh, learning from uh, success and failure. So I have already invited uh, you to collaborate um, so do not hesitate uh, to also use our Reu Digital Agriculture uh, email address, and I may ask uh, Rinor uh, to put it back in the chat. Um, and um, we will continue collaborating. Today, these presentations were more kind of appetizer, because uh, we will have other uh, more specific uh, webinars on uh, specific topics. Uh, so we will meet again. Uh, we continue uh, the rendezvous and uh, the menu is uh, a, a lot more than what uh, we have had today. So we will have a lot more flavor. Um, I would like also to say that um, with ITU, we have done this call on good practices. Uh, on uh, the digital uh, excellence in agriculture. Um, it was done during COVID time. We received many, many, many applications, about 200. So we are still screening them because we will have 21 awardees. And we can already inform you that on the 23rd of September, uh, we will have the award ceremony. This means that people who were asking, but what are these uh, uh, technologies, the use uh, in agriculture, this, this stock taking exercise that we have been doing will be available in the next months, and uh, you will discover even more. So I need to thank you all for having participated, uh, all the participants that have been uh, with us today, but also um, the speakers, the panelists, the interpreters, um, the colleagues behind the screens, because to do this event, uh, it requires many, many, many people. So uh, I would like to extend all my thanks to the colleagues, uh, to all the speakers, and I'm really glad that uh, we have done this event today. So thank you very much uh, to all of you. Um, 
we will try to respond to the, the, the questions that have not immediately been answered and we will do a follow up with you. So thank you very much to all of you and uh, see you soon. Thank you all.